afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the TMS today. Uh, we have a pleasure to, to have as uh, our uh, guest, uh, uh, Dr. Saba Khan uh, from Manchester. She is a senior scientist uh, based in uh, Manchester, UK, uh, with over 15 years of laboratory experience in research, academic, commercial and public sector environments. She has been recognized for having promoted the growth and expansion of COVID-19 testing labs nationally and internationally. Committed to science and a team player, she has always engaged in continuous learning to positively impact public health. She's a female founder of a health tech startup company called the Science Foundation and is now an independent lab consultant. And uh, Saba will uh, talk today about life of a laboratory consultant. So thank you, Saba, for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Anna. Uh, That's a lovely introduction. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what a laboratory consultant is and how I got to where I am. Sure. It's quite a unique uh, career path that I've gone down. So I just wanted to sort of explain how I got to where I am and things that I think are really, really important. So I think the first thing is to really understand what your personality type is. So I'm an ENFP, which means I'm an extrovert. And I think by understanding what your personality type is, you can help actually play to your strengths. And that's really important, I think. And so if you believe in the Maya Briggs personality test and you have been tested, you have tested your own personality type. I think it's actually really interesting because you can then actually see how you interact with other people and what uh, helps you to make decisions, how you um, decide and how you what governs your career path, I think is, is very much dependent on your personality type. So I'm a campaigner, which means I like to see the bigger picture. I like to look at, I like to work for companies where I can see the vision and the goal and actually believe in the, 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 the bigger picture and actually working for a cause bigger than myself. And so that I think is really important um, when you're choosing a career path. So for me, I'm very much customer focused. I like to be around people. I like talking to people. Um, and so that's, I think is really important when you're starting on your career path. So some of the things that I find that I'll, are that I'm really passionate about is teaching. So when I worked at the University of Manchester in an academic setting, I loved teaching undergrads. So I taught master's students, undergrad students, PhD students, and that really fulfilled me. So I loved going into a lab and teaching uh, a new undergrad or a new PhD student, say how to do an ELISA or how to do a PCR. And that for me was very rewarding. So I think this also builds into your personality type. So if you are very, um, if you're, if you like teaching and you like working with people, this is something that, you know, you might want to pursue like a career in teaching. So I loved and I was very passionate about teaching and it gave me the opportunity to learn more because when you're working with students, they often do things that probably aren't in an SOP or aren't in a protocol, but actually they see some things in a different way and it actually makes you question how you've always been taught as well. So I think, you know, you can learn a lot from students. So I know when you're at a university and, you know, you have a, a massive influx of students that appear at your lab, it can seem very um, daunting and it, it, it seems quite stressful, but actually you learn a lot from students. I've just got an annotation request approved. Um, so when you are um, teaching students, you actually learn a lot from them. So I think it's a two way, it's a two way process. So I was very passionate about uh, teaching students. I've just received an annotation request, which means I can't move on to the next slide. Maybe you can just push the forward button. Try that. Oh yeah, there we go. Sorry, I've just drawn loads of dots on there. 
Okay. So one of the projects that I was um, quite heavily involved in at the University of Manchester, which is where I worked for about 12 to 15 years, I, um, I was really involved with COVID-19 and this was part of a CERCO study. So it was actually a, a very collaborative study. Um, it involved uh, four hospitals across Greater Manchester. So we had um, the Manchester Royal Infirmary, Salford Royal, uh, North Manchester and also Withenshaw Hospital, so four hospitals uh, within our vicinity. And this was right at the very beginning of the pandemic, so anyone who came in with COVID-like symptoms, uh, they were recruited onto this longitudinal study. And the aim of this study was essentially to try and generate an immune profile. So we wanted to, so anyone, anyone who came in with COVID-like symptoms were recruited onto this study, and we were taking blood samples from them every single day. And what we wanted to do is to try and build an immune profile and then categorize those patients into mild, moderate or severe, depending on their disease severity. And what we were really interested in was, well, some patients came into the hospital and actually they were quite mild, but then over the course of time, they became moderate and then severe and then were in ICU, for example. But then some patients came in quite severe and over time, actually, they became better and were discharged and released and went home. So we wanted to see what was unique about uh each patient that helped them either to get worse or get better um, and then we realized when we took part in this study that you could identify patients based on you know their admission so the state of their immune profile on their admission was actually quite indicative so you could see that um, patients who became quite severe actually on admission they actually had high ki67 they had low COX-2, they had a low T-cell count and high neutrophil count. So this was really interesting because it helped then, um, it helped then uh, decide on the uh, clinical decision that was made and the clinical outcome and the treatment of those patients. And so this was something that I really um, was quite interested in. And, you know, following on from research at the University of Manchester, I was then um, asked to take part in um, a film production. So here, um, the National Geographic and uh, Disney approached me to set up a COVID-19 testing laboratory. So they, this was at the time when there was no filming going on anywhere in the world. So this was actually the largest global film production at the start of the pandemic. And they were looking for essentially an immunologist. They didn't really need an immunologist, but they approached me at the university and said, oh, would you like to uh, set up a COVID-19 testing lab in Iceland? So I travelled to Iceland, uh, set up a laboratory um, and from scratch and then tested about 200 cameramen. And all these cameramen were on, um, they were all sort of like David Attenborough type cameramen. So this was a very um, sort of like a nature documentary. And so I was based in Reykjavik whilst all the uh, filming was going on across three different sites across Iceland. So they were filming um, on these three amazing locations. And every single day I had a production runner. So she would take me to the airport. We would collect the nasal swabs and then we'd go back to the laboratory. I would test the samples and then give the results out. So this was an amazing experience. And it was one of those things that, you know, you it's only once you're put in that situation that you actually know how to um, what to do. So I was, you know, scoping out labs, I was doing site surveys, I was, you know, building a laboratory from scratch and then setting up a sort of a testing infrastructure. And having done that, it actually gave me a wealth of experience. And that's what led me uh, to then work for the UK HSA. So the UK HSA is, uh, is a part of the government um, in the UK. And so when I returned back from Iceland, I then worked for the UK Health Security Agency. And then my role was then to set up COVID-19 testing laboratories. So this was very operational. So I was um, a part of something called the Tiger Team, and this was a very operational arm of the government. And some of the things that we did, um, and it wasn't a very, you know, it wasn't a, a very set job description. It was whatever was required on the job. So, you know, I did things like site surveys. So I looked at, you know, potential sites to build a laboratory. 
I wrote business justification templates. So to help, you know, build a lab from scratch. So you write a business case um, and then you look at how much staff you need um, in terms of equipment, reagents and consumables. And um, so and in terms of a lot of the time when you set up a lab, you have to do some like minor refurbishment work. So we looked at all of those things and um, so we built business cases. Uh, we also wrote um, a bill of materials, which is a sort of what you need. So it's a list of all the equipment and reagents that you need in order to set up a COVID-19 testing lab. Um, I also draw did uh, floor plans. So this is where you go into a, a, a lab and then you say, well, oh, actually, we need you know, 12 biological safety cabinets in this COVID-19 testing lab. And where would, you know, would we have enough space to put all of this equipment? So this is where I would draw floor plans and then actually design the workflow. So then I would design a laboratory. So then I would say, well, this is going to be the entrance of the laboratory. This is going to be the donning doffing area. So where you put on your PPE, so your lab coat and your gloves. This is going to be where the sample accessioning or your sample reception is then this is going to be where your sample processing is and then moving on then this will be where your data analysis is so we designed the entire labs and the entire floor spaces and that was uh, a new experience and it was you know so vital and so critical uh, to do this as part of the government program we also for labs that had already set up and were already operational and running we also in order to improve the lab performance. So we obviously had to deliver a certain capacity. So because we were testing um, members of the public and uh, we were also a part of an NHS asymptomatic screening program. So this is where we were testing doctors and nurses who worked within hospitals. We wanted to make sure that we could deliver a high capacity. So in order to do that, we needed to imp improve the lab performance. So this is when we would go into a laboratory and look at the sample throughput. So we'd do a sort of a time and motion study. So we would look, we would go in and look at, uh, follow a sample through from start to finish. So would follow a sample all the way through the laboratory and see how long each step took and where that sample was going. And if there was ways to streamline that process, uh, we, would, um, we, would, we would implement that in order to improve the, the performance and the sample throughput. For some labs as well, we also, uh, we developed a highly automated COVID-19 screening platform. And this was in order to process 7,000 samples per work cell. So a work cell is a, a screening platform is the automated screening platform. So we uh, developed a highly automated COVID-19 screening platform, which was clinically validated at the University of Leicester. Um, and that was a very challenging project because it took a, a lot of time and uh, involved a lot of people to, in, in order to get this operational. But the lab automation, you know, the, for the business case, it reduced uh, repetitive strain injury and it also increased sample throughput. Um, so they were really interesting projects to work on. And then following the, um, so after I worked in the government, uh, setting up COVID-19 testing labs and sort of around March, uh, 31st of March in 2022, which is when the government program came to an end, I then decided, well, actually, I think it'd be very useful um, and it'd be quite nice to set up my own consultancy company. And this is kind of where I take sort of all the skills and the networks and the connections that I've made on the government program, but also within universities um, and also within the film production to then actually branch out and set up my own company. Um, and so this is where the Tiger Team Lab consultancy co uh, company has come from. And as part of that, and it is a very, uh, it's, it's a sort of a novel role um, that I've sort of created for myself, but it's essentially what we do on that is we provide scientific advice um, and I'll go into describe what kind of advice we provide. Um, as a lab consultant, you generally have quite large networks and connections. Um, so as a lab consultant, you go to a lot of networking events, so sort of health tech events, um, med tech events, uh, you know, conferences, um, symposiums and things like that. So you attend a lot of events and you make a lot of uh, connections and networks and they're all really useful because they come useful when you have uh, a particular project. 
So then we work on a diverse range of uh, projects. So we have a diverse range of clients and also a diverse range of projects that we work on. But then every client that comes to you, you probably need a, a very unique contact to carry that job out. So that's why it's really useful to have a large network of contacts. So projects can include um, a range of things. So there is a lot of diversity in the projects that you work on because every client that comes to you comes to you with their own unique project. So a day to day life of a lab consultant is never the same. Um, every project and the length of the length of time for each project as well can vary. So some projects can be very small, as in you work on a project for a day, for example, because it's just reviewing a very simple document or you could be involved in a project for six months because it involves uh, setting up a lab from scratch, for example. So um, some of the projects can include um, hospital labs. So this is where you can improve the efficiency or the sample turnaround time. We could also work with um, biotech startup companies. So here in the UK, there's actually quite a large uh, hub of biotech startup companies, particularly in the north, um, in sort of like Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, but also down south in sort of Oxford, Cambridge area and London area. So there's a lot of biotech startup companies. Um, and these quite often involve um, setting up a lab from scratch, writing new SOPs, risk assessments, um, designing workflows. So they're um, also, so they're quite interesting projects to work on. We also work with sort of pharmaceutical companies. So um, MSLs or clinical trials assistants. So this is where, you know, if they have a clinical trial with a particular vaccine or a drug, they may want to use you as an independent reviewer of their results or their documentation. So we work with pharmaceutical companies. We also work with other scientists and clinicians. So um, scientists and clinicians can have quite complex data sets. So um, they could have, for example, uh, next generation sequencing data that they just don't understand or they don't know how to interpret that data. So we have um, scientists and clinicians who approach us with uh, so very complex data sets that quite often requires a bioinformatician or a biostatistician. So it's very good to have, you know, connections and networks um, who can help you uh, to do that. Um, also lab automation companies, um, so especially when you're designing lab automation, it does require um, scientific input, um, especially to make it, especially to make that automation quite unique to the customer and to their workflows. So uh, one of the roles that I did um, previously when I worked for a lab automation company was sitting down with the customer and looking through their manual SOPs and their manual protocols and then looking at what is quite unique to that protocol. So, um, for example, if it's an ELISA or if it's a PCR, looking at what is sensitive. So, for example, PCR master mix needs to be kept at four degrees. So it's making sure that things like that, um, if reagents are time sensitive or pH sensitive or, um, you know, if there's anything that's quite critical to those reagents that that's actually factored in to the lab automation and to the design of it otherwise you're left with something that's quite impractical um, and it's very hard to to redesign it once it's been built and then obviously once the lab automation has been installed that it takes quite a while before you go operational and live so you then need to do a whole body of work uh, which we call validation and verification and this involves um, this involves doing lots of QC work and testing that each component of the equipment is working. So we call this uh, IQ, OQ, PQ. So this is the installation qualification, the operational qualification, and then the performance qualification. So you have to make sure that, you know, if you've got a very large automated platform, that all the individual components of that are working as you expect it to work. And they're giving you the correct results. Uh, we also work with government organisations and um, this is to provide sort of independent advice and also to review data. Um, and this is so it's always nice to have and I think in science because so much of the work we do 
we almost have like sort of tunnel vision. So it's always nice to have a independent review or someone else who can give you sort of almost like a second pair of eyes to look over your data and look over uh, your SOPs and your protocols just to see if what you're doing is correct and if there is any room to improve, you've got someone there to help you and to guide you and give you that advice. Um, a laboratory consultant never actually processes clinical samples, so we're not insured to actually go on site and process clinical samples. And you probably, you know, no one in a laboratory would want uh, an external contractor to come in and start processing clinical samples. So um, that's one of the things that we we do not do. And obviously, when you work in hospital labs or you're visiting a hospital labs, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, GDPR. So we have to make sure that there's, you know, the samples. There's a lot of data protection. So um, you would never go in and process uh, you would never actually go in and process clinical samples if you were to go on site so um one of the things that i noticed um when i worked on the covid program and just generally during the pandemic there seemed to be a shift in the mindset of scientists so I found that before the pandemic, scientists used to be very secretive um, about what they were working on and what they were doing. And I think what was nice to see during the pandemic, especially when we worked on this very large government program, where we had sort of 20 laboratories across the UK, is that we actually all came together. We worked together in a very collaborative way. And that was quite nice to see. And because we had so many uh, labs and so many scientists and clinicians working on this program, we were all working collectively in order to fight this one common goal, right? We were all working towards one common goal, which was uh, COVID-19. And after sort of towards the end of the, the COVID-19 testing program, I thought, well, Actually, wouldn't it be nice if we had something very similar? So if we had, if we worked together as scientists, but on a more uh, sort of global level, so we worked together in order to fight global healthcare challenges. And that's where the Science Foundation has come from. Um, so this is a, a new health tech startup company. I am working with um, a company in the UK called Innovate UK uh, to in order to develop this. So it's at, at the minute it's very much a um, it's very conceptual at the minute. So we are working to develop it into an actual product and, and get a, a business case and a business model. Um, but this is a, a new thing that I'm working on, which is to have a global uh, sort of an online scientific platform where scientists can come together and collaborate. And obviously there's a lot of um, issues around sort of GDPR and things like that. But this is in order, this is to try and create almost like a think tank. So scientists can come together um, and work collectively uh, with all the um, resources that they need, like literature, um, to have AR as well. So I think a lot of what we do in science, and we don't realise this, is it's quite three dimensional. So to be able to understand, say, stem cell biology, but in a three dimensional way would be amazing, right? And I think a lot of the time in science, we look at things and it's it's from textbooks or it's from papers. And so the aim of this is to have um, quite an immersive educational experience. So you can um, you could have artificial, you could have AR where you can um, actually look at cells and say, well, this is a healthy cell, for example, this is what it looks like. Um, but in, uh, say, cancer, this is what a cancerous cell looks like. So you can actually see those cells come to life. You can see them in, in um, 3D and it will actually help then with the learning process, but also to help come to sort of solutions as well. So that's a new project that I'm working on and uh, hopefully, so watch the space. So hopefully, it will. Um, I'll be working on it more this year. So, sort of my concluding um, remarks. Um, so, one of the things that I think is really important is to always work towards building your dream. And I think this is really important because if you're not working towards building your dream, 
then you're working towards building someone else's dream. So I think it's actually really important to understand what your personality type is and what motivates you in science. So I've always been a science advocate. So I've always loved being in science and working in science. So I think it's really important to know what drives you and what motivates you. I've always been driven by my passion to learn new things. Um, which is why I've gone sort of from academia to uh, working in hospitals and working in the government um, and then setting up my own company. But I think it's really, really important to uh, to know what your passions and what dream, what your dreams are and to be um, and to be to know how that interacts with other people as well. So sometimes what you want is not necessarily what other people expect from you. So it's it's knowing um, how your personality fits in with your dreams and your aspirations and, and also your career goals and your career aspirations. So thank you for that, um, giving me the opportunity to talk today. Um, do you have any questions? Because I know you wanted to spend more time on, on questions. Thank you, Sab. It was really, very interesting and inspiring, I think, especially for young people. Uh, did I understand well that this happened in the last year, in less than one year? You built yeah. on this? Yeah, it has, it has actually happened in the last year. <laughs> Well, this is really impressive, I must say, because you switched from one job to another. And uh, yeah, it's really very professionally organized. Of course, we are open to the questions from the audience. You can write your question in the chat or even better, you can unmute yourself and show up and uh, ask your question. Uh, I have some. Uh, oh, OK, I have Evie here uh, who raised the, the hand. So unmute yourself, Evie. Hi, um, so I'm actually a student alongside Milo and Adam who are also on this call. I'm a student at Manchester. Uh, we're okay. doing a placement currently, so in third year um, undergraduate. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we're all in the position where we're starting to decide what we're going to do with our future, like if we want to stay in science or like move out of science. And I was just wondering, like, can you think back, I guess, to when you were our age and did you know if you wanted to do a PhD straight away and stay in academia or do you always thought about doing something like consultancy or something like that? So that's a really good question. And by the way, I love Manchester University. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was an un so when I was an undergrad and when I was finishing it, I think no one really tells you how difficult it is to get your first job. So when I graduated, I was kind of just like, oh my God, what do I do? And the first thing I actually did was I actually got a job in the NHS. So I got a job as a medical lab assistant in microbiology uh, at Stepping Hill Hospital. And it took so long to find that job. And I think I spent six months job hunting after I graduated. I didn't go straight into, uh, I didn't go straight back into the university. I actually uh, took some time out to look for a job. And uh, when I worked in the hospital, uh, that's when I kind of realized, oh, microbiology is kind of like really, it wasn't my cup of tea. It was, they were like really yucky, horrible samples. So I had like hundreds of like urine samples to process on a Monday morning. So I hated it. Um, so I was there for like six months, a year. And then I kind of realized, oh, well, um, they did actually offer me and the hospitals were amazing because they had such a structure. So you could go from an MLA to a BMS level one to a BMS level two. So there was there's obviously a very good structure um, to working in the hospital labs. But then I realized my degree wasn't accredited. Um, so that's when I kind of thought, well, actually, if I wanted to pursue a career as a an, as a an accredited biomedical scientist, I would have to go down the route of then doing top up units. Um, I would have to uh, do like a day release, so I'd have to go one day a week and then do that. And then I realized, well, actually, that's not you know I'm not really enjoying the job, and you know, why, you know, why would I want to, you know, pursue this any further? So that's when I went back into the university and actually went back as a research technician to begin with. And that as, you know, joining as a technician, actually, it gave me quite a lot of experience. So I think 
you know consultancy has never occurred to me until you know the you know within the past six to nine months um but yeah i think just finding a job and just learning from the experience is kind of the most valuable thing um because i you know i went into you know microbiology and i hated it or i hated hospital you know i hated that particular hospital job um but it kind of just made me realize well oh, that's something that I'm, I'm i don't want to do any further so you know that's when i went into a more academic lab setting thank you Sabah. uh i yeah, there is uh, um, a question in the chat from Luca. Uh, thank you for your very interesting presentation. Maybe I missed it, but I was wondering how the link is made. Do you check, for example, a PI project and find out companies or hospitals to link? Or do you write a project in which there will be involved labs, companies and hospitals? So what is which way? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. So the no, I don't write the projects. No, um, because you'd have to have funding to you know to do the project. So I reach out to a lot of different people. So I will reach out to clinicians, scientists, um, doctors, to um, MSLs, so medical scientific liaisons. So I reach out to people who are already working on an existing project. So. Um, I reach out to them and then say, is there, a, you know, is there any scope for projects or is there a scope for a collaboration? Do you need any help with anything? So I offer my, so I reach out to my customers and ask them if they need support. So that's the way it works. So, you know, I don't actually have those projects. They're, in, they're the projects that I collaborate and work on. Thank you. I saw um, a hand arise by Nibiu. Nebu, hi Nebu. Hi Saba. Uh, thanks, <laughs> thanks, thanks so much for that. I'm still trying to work out the interface for this uh, WebEx. This is the first time I'm using it. But uh, oh. th thanks so much for that presentation. That was re re really interesting. Oh, um, what, one question I have, which you sort of alluded to in the previous question, is yeah. sort of obviously you have like quite a lot of experience, but sort of in the early stages, sort of how did you kind of make that jump from sort of you have your job sort of working your role, but then sort of yeah. making that jump to sort of other people either reaching out to you for assistance on external projects or you reaching out to projects which you found interesting and that you wish to contribute to. For example, the, the experience you had in Iceland, which sounds like an, an amazing experience. How, yeah. how, how exactly did you sort of build yourself up to the point where sort of they reached out to you or I don't know, did you reach out to them? Uh, what, what's the story no, behind that? So they, so, um, they actually approached uh, the university. So they were looking for an immunologist. So I think it's probably a little bit to do with just fate and an opportunity. So, you know, an opportunity arose and I kind of thought I really want to go for it. And I know um, I had a friend as well at the university who wanted to do it, you know, who wanted to do it that as well. And um, she decided not to in the end um so it was kind of the opportunity came and i kind of thought a lot of people didn't take that opportunity and you know they were looking for someone with immunology um uh, they were looking for a scientist with uh, mm -hmm, any kind mm -hmm. of covid immunology background so i kind of just i just took the opportunity really it came and i kind of said yes and i didn't really i didn't really look back i was kind of worried about oh well you know we're in the middle of a pandemic it's a lockdown everyone's staying at yeah. home and you know but i kind of just thought well no actually i think this is a, i think this is an amazing opportunity and mm -hmm. i just took it so um that was I suppose by luck uh, that that came to the University of Manchester and it came um, that I volunteered myself to work on that project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I suppose from there, I've kind of just always looked for, I don't know, I think I suppose I've always, I've gone out and looked for things as well. So after I came back from Iceland, I kind of, I was um, sort of kind of feeling, well, actually these are really useful skills, you know, setting up labs. So that's when I looked for jobs. So I was looking online or I think actually the job for UKHSA actually came into my sort of spam email and it mentioned uh, because it was using it wasn't using PCR for COVID testing. It was actually using another technology, another technology called RT Lamp. And it was the same technology that I'd used in Iceland. So I kind of thought, well, actually, it's the same assay 
and now the government here in the UK are using the same assay to test the public so that was kind of, and the email had actually come into my junk email so that's where I was like oh my goodness this sounds really interesting it's the same you know it's the, actually the same technology and the same thing that I was doing in Iceland so that's how I um, got onto the UK HSA uh, COVID program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's very interesting so would you say that trip to Iceland uh, and that experience sort of put you on the path to where you are now or did you always sort of even before that sort of envision sort of going down this route no i think it's i think it, I, yeah i think the i think the trip to iceland probably um probably spurred it kind of like springboarded me really and mm -hmm. to the next job and then the next job mm -hmm. but yeah i do think yeah i do think i've been very fortunate with the the jobs that i've had and the experiences that i've had because i've worked with you know I've worked with them, you know, amazing set of people. So, you know, everyone on the on the film production, you know, shoot were absolutely amazing and they were all freelance contractors, mm -hmm. you know, they were all mm -hmm. cameramen, so they were all freelance. So mm -hmm. that's kind of where I got a feel for actually, you know, being your own boss and, you know, going to sites and working on different projects. Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing. I saw I saw Will Smith was on the the cover. Did you did you get to meet him at all? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, so I, I didn't actually get to meet him, unfortunately. But I did test his, um, I did test his his DNA. So. <laughs> oh yes, 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 just as good, I guess, just as good. <laughs> All right, thanks, Emma. I'll, I'll pass on to someone else. Thank you, Nevu. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any other question? Anyone that wants to unmute and ask? Um, I, I have something to ask. Um, so I saw that uh, your work is quite heterogeneous because uh, you are a consultant for many different issues. So I guess that you have uh, several people working with you with different expertise. How is your group structured to make the, the group efficient? Uh, do you yes. have any trick or what? Well, it's not, there's no trick to it really. It kind of depends what the so each client that comes up to me they have their own unique project so it's whatever skill sets they need I will then go to my network and say can you consult and help on this project so it's almost like I then I'm almost uh, subcontracting or you know finding uh, another collaborator to work on um, but the main ones tend to be um, so we have a health and safety lead because they're obviously very important so health and safety and quality um, in order to design lab automation um, I work quite closely with uh, mechanical design engineers um, I also work with uh, bioinformaticians or biostatistician especially when it comes to sort of you know very large data sets so I actually go out and find those people so they're people who um, have a, a very unique skill set um, but it's unique and will aid or benefit that project so there I have a f I have a few people that work uh, closely with me um, and they're all um, it's it's not a job that they do full-time so I'm the only full-time person everyone else is almost doing it um, as a, in their spare time but if there's a client that needs something that's quite 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 particular uh, or quite a unique skill set, then I actually go out and find that person. Uh, but are they employees or are they are, say, freelance? I don't know if they, they're, 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 free, they're, they're almost freelancers as well. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it's almost like it's a it's a, it's almost like a side gig for them. So it's um, the the main people tend to be the is the health and safety and the quality. Um, but everyone else are very unique. Their their skill sets are very very unique. Um, and it's not like because the each customer project is going to be quite some of them quite are quite short projects so they're not you know regular they're not reoccurring or regular so that's why they're sort of consulted they're almost consulted with on a just on a sort of a client basis yeah and i have a question that is uh more technical i would say so yeah. when you work in an in a in a, in an automated uh highly automated uh lab with uh, yeah. you know i think that there are many many advantages uh, but probably there is also some at uh, disadvantage um because um if you do everything automatically but you don't know the principle uh you mentioned that you need to check uh, point by point that everything uh, works properly but if you don't have any manual uh, expertise on a specific uh, reaction or whatever um, is this 
something that can uh, uh, induce some uh, mistakes so that you maybe do not recognize because you don't know exactly what the machine is doing yeah yeah so if you were going to um <clears throat> if you're going to automate a manual process you would really have to know that manual process very very well so when we were automating our covid screening platform i was you know i was almost consulting on that on that project because i knew the manual assay very very well i knew that in depth um so and I knew all the technical issues and all the sort of the intricacies of that assay. So you really do need to know your manual assay very, very well to know what a positive result looks like and what a negative result should look like. So it would be very difficult if you didn't know um, it would be very, very challenging if you really didn't know your manual assay very well and then you decided to automate it because you really wouldn't know the results that, you know, the quality of the results that came off the other end of that automated platform. You wouldn't know if they, you know, how, you know, how much they stand up really. So it's quite good to, yeah, you would only automate a process if you, if you were sort of not an expert on it, but you, you knew the assay manually very well. At least you knew what the results should look like. So what a positive result looks like or what negative results looks like. You know, sometimes the results can be quite binary because it's, you know, you're looking at things on, I don't know, like a logarithmic scale. So that's when you have to really test. Um, we actually, in order to validate an automated platform, what we actually do is do a side by side comparison. So you'd have someone perform that assay. So you'd have a scientist in the lab performing that assay on a manual platform. And then you'd have the automated platform doing it as well. So, um, <clears throat> so you'd actually have this two side by side comparisons. So you'd have a manual versus automated. And then you'd be comparing those results to make sure that you weren't losing the sensitivity or you weren't losing the specificity of the assay. So those things are really, really crucial, especially if it's being used in a diagnostic assay. Yeah. So those things are really, really critical. So, uh, yeah, you really do need to know the assay um, and how the assay performs on a manual bench. Well, I fully agree with you because sometimes uh, the machine makes mistakes that you do not realize. Or, uh, you know, when you have the results, if even if you have one single red cell more, <laughs> it is written in red with a warning that you have something very bad. Yeah, and yeah. It's not, <laughs> it's not the, yeah. That the case. So I think that it's very useful for uh, uh, those who are learning to know manually how it works. Oh, and definitely. then you can recognize, yes, this is very, very nice. Uh, other questions? Uh, anything you want to know? The students from Manchester, since uh, Saba is there, maybe. <laughs> okay. Does the University of Manchester support this? I mean, uh, uh, there are specific courses to help setting a consultant uh, job or uh, it's no, it's you. not. Uh, yeah, no, it's completely up to you. There's no, um, there's no course on it or anything like that. Um, but the University of Manchester, I think, was very good in the sense that um, I'll just stop sharing my screen now. But um, the University of Manchester was very good in the sense that it really got you to think for yourself. So when I was an undergrad there, you know, I could go into I could go into my professor's office and say, actually, I think, you know, this, this and this might be going on. And, you know, my professor would be like, yeah, I think that's a great idea. And then I would then go into the lab and he'd say, you know, you know, go knock yourself out. You can buy your primers and, you know, I'd be like, oh, I think, you know, it might be to do with this gene. And he'd say, yeah, fine. Just, you know, you can go buy the primers and, you know, there's a the lab, knock yourself out. And then, you know, I'd come back in two weeks with the results presented in lab meeting and, you know, it would show something interesting going on. So I think that kind of being in a scientific environment where you're constantly very inquisitive, you're explorative, you're, you know, you're discovering new pathways or you're discovering what's missing in a pathway. I think that kind of environment actually it helps you later on in life because then you're thinking well you look at things and you say oh well there's actually a, there's a big gap in the market here for you know a lab consultant you know and then that's I think that's how I've got to where I am today because I could see things in a very 
I don't know, maybe a scientific way, because you can yeah. you look at trends, right? As a scientist, you're trained to look for trends, you're trained to look for patterns. Um, you know, you look at data in that kind of way. So I think um, that's what's kind of led me to become a, a consultant, really. Thank you. Milo, you have a question? Can I mute yourself? And yeah, did, you the I had one, one question about the Circo study, if that's okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, so you're able to categorize patients based on their severity and their immune profile. Yeah. Like, do you know how this that sort of affected the different treatments that were given to the different categories of patients? Um, so it was a longitudinal uh, study. Um, it was more to do with it was more to advise the clinicians to say, actually, if you are severe, then these are the things that you probably shouldn't be on these drug treatments. So it was more to look at how you how we could then implement a drug treatment right. rather than having a direct impact on their current treatment. Okay. So it was more to understand their immune profile and yeah. if there was a way um, we could look at uh, altering their drug their current drug treatment. Okay. Nice. If they were on steroids and things like that, so we had quite in terms of the demographics, we had quite a huge cohort, and there was um, we had a biostatistician looking at you know age, BMI, uh, smoking, um, etc. So we were looking at all different um, things. So it was actually you know when you've got a very very large data set like that across you know four hospitals and you've got thousands of patients it's actually the data can get quite messy so you actually yeah. really do need to um it's hard to make to say oh well, this particular category of people or this particular group of people um should be treated in a certain way perfect very very interesting Thank you. Uh, would you recommend a PhD before starting a job like yours, or this is not really necessary? I don't think it's. I think having a PhD is amazing because it gives you um, so much in terms of project management skills, and I think you don't realize this when. Um, you know, as a, an actual student, you don't realize how many skills you've picked up because you kind of always you because you are classified as a student. You always think that you don't know as much as people who are working. And but when you actually you enter the work environment and you enter the work stream, you actually realize, you know, having having gone through that academic route, you actually you know how to manage time, you know how to manage your own project. You know how to manage resources. Um, you know how to get training. You know how to um, you know how to use Excel. You know how to use different softwares. So you actually you pick up a lot of skills that you don't realize. And actually, when you meet people, you kind of say, "Oh, actually, you've got quite a lot of skills." And you realize, "Oh, it's probably because they've done a PhD, so they they can actually manage their own time a lot better." Thank you. Very interesting. Any further question? Any comment? Yeah, I think that uh, Saba will be available in case you have questions. Maybe you can reach her out by email. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I've I've popped my email address um, on the slide. You, you can put in. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I saw it. Maybe I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, yeah. You you can also copy in the chat. Yes. Case. In any case, we record the, the the presentation so in case they can copy from uh, from that. It's up to you. Excellent. Okay. So you can copy in case and or you can come through me and uh, we will contact Saba. So Saba, I think that your talk has been really expiring. And uh, what I, I told you already, what I very much like about you is the enthusiasm that you put in your job. It, it was a, a, a path that you went through uh, several steps, but I think that you found the, the, the way how to, to manage your life uh, in the best way. Because if you are happy at work, you are happy also. 
other side of the world. Yeah, <laughs> and say. you know, I've not always I've not always been in jobs that I've been really really happy in. You know, I've I've been in some jobs where I thought, oh my god, it's this job is destroying my soul. Um, I cannot go on. But then it kind of that motivates you and it pushes you to say, well, actually, I'm not happy in this job. There's no point whinging or whining about it. What is it that I am looking for? And yeah. then it kind of pushes you and it motivates you and it spurs you on to go and and do the next thing. And so yeah, I've not always been happy in jobs, but I've always you know I've always learned a lesson from it and then moved on. Yeah, there are not good jobs and bad jobs, but there are jobs that you like or dislike. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's why it's really important to understand like your personality type. So you know, it's you know, some companies that I've worked in, I kind of just think the company's vision and my vision aren't in line. So you know, if it's not in line, then you're not going to be happy. So I think that's why it's really important to understand you know your personality type and what motivates you so that you are you know you're always in line with the company's vision and if you're not then you know just set up your own company <laughs> okay thank you very much uh oh, thank yeah, you, there are other thank you by <laughs> the chat and yeah i agree it was really a great job a great uh, talk okay so thank you very much and uh, i hope we can uh, stay in touch and uh, the students from manchester have a friend there now so when you oh, go back, yeah. maybe you can visit and uh yes in case we can uh, reconnect in another occasion okay yeah. okay thanks thank a you lot all. and uh bye 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 Thank you. Bye.